All of us, we are all wanderers. Our destinies, they decided by a cosmic roll of the dice, the whims of the stars, the vagrant breezes of fortune, which blow from the windmills of the gods. Now that's a little poem or a quote from someone called H. L. Dietrich. And why do I use it? Because it's some strange combination, unknowable combination of the windmills of the gods, the whims of the stars, the roll of the dice, landed me, someone from a completely different part of the world, into the city of Houston in 1996. City of Houston, July 20th, going to be the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. You know what John Kennedy called the city when he spoke here? This is a city known for knowledge, for progress, for strength. Good fortune that I landed here. Now, around the time I came here, on this landscape, the corporate landscape, there was a gem, a jewel, a brightly burning star, widely respected all over the world, spoken of in the highest of terms across the nation. Fortune magazine, six years in a row, 95, 96, 97. 98, 99, 2000, said that this company is the most innovative company in the United States. 2001, one of the top analysts of Goldman Sachs, this is a unique and an extraordinary company. <laughs> Enron. Enron, when I came here, Enron was everywhere. We looked up to it. It was on the stadiums. And even my son was young then. And on Saturdays, he used to, Sundays, he used to go to this thing called the Houston Youth Symphony, and he had to practice, and then they would have concerts. Lead sponsor, Kenneth Lay, Linda Lay. Enron was everywhere. And it's always a pride to have a company like this. The companies I used to look up to were Microsoft and Apple. But there was a difference. I couldn't understand how Enron made money. And I was a freshly minted MBA, so I even made an effort. <laughs> But I just really, I didn't understand what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> then in not a meeting like this, I ran into someone, I'd known him before, who was a computer contractor, working in Enron, dedicated to Enron. So I asked him, can you please explain to me how Enron makes money? And he said something, and I pretended to understand. But then he said something. He said, shall I tell you what I think? I think it's a terribly run company. I see people, just movers coming and moving furniture from this office to that office, from that office to this office. And I really think it's a badly run company. It was the first I heard this opinion. And I couldn't help thinking, if you don't understand something, well, either I'm ignorant or there is some fraud. Something fraudulent about this, I won't be surprised if it shows up. And that is what happened. <coughs> We soon learned what happened. Who are the, why were they the smartest guys in the room? What exactly did they do? Comes down to three things. They were superb at PR. We are the greatest, we are the greatest, we are the greatest. If you're a risk manager and you hear that, red flag. We are superb. Everyone will write wonderful things about you. They came up with a technique. There was a valid accounting technique called mark to market. It's a way of recognizing future profits but they used it to create any amount of fictitious profits. And then there's something else called an SPC, a special purpose entity, a special purpose vehicle, and huge documents created assets, all used for hiding losses. These three things resulted in them fooling the public for quite a while until they got caught. So, all the blame came on to people, or maybe you want to add Andrew, Fast Andrew Fastow. And here again, I started you know, there is something that we do, we glorify, 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 and then we vilify, vilify, vilify. Mm -hmm. We tend to do that, but between this, there is a zone of objectivity, where we do our best thinking. And in that zone, no part of this made sense to me. Two people, three people, over and over you heard that they were able to recruit the best of the best from the best universities. Nobody could see that something is wrong. Ah, this doesn't make sense to me. What is happening if I'm not willing to glorify or vilify? 
This was a question that started playing in my mind. And more and more I began to get convinced that amongst other things, this was a colossal failure of risk management. Just a thought that went into my mind. The risk managers didn't do their jobs or they were suppressed so much that they couldn't do their jobs. It was one thought. There are many reasons, but I believe that this is a major reason. And I began to wonder, later on, five years later, when the, everyone's house was going up double and triple and I'm buying, I just kept on thinking to myself, the whole nation is being enroned. What happened there is being happened here. There are fictitious profits and costs are hidden, or there's some wrong information. I kept having this feeling, this nation is being enroned. And I thought that the same system is behind. And then when it happened, again, we blame the greedy people. When they're doing well, superb, what heroes, my God, what courage they've got. When things go wrong, look at the crooks, look at greed, look at this. It's almost like a stuck record we go into this. But we don't think about why did this happen? Would we have behaved differently if we were there? These are the questions that keep coming to my mind. So again, I said, no, no, this is a risk management failure also. And significantly, though, we'd never discuss it. They're just thoughts that went through my mind. Well, QMI, PMI, North Chapter, thank you so much for inviting me back. It's just a pleasure to be here. My first PMI meeting was in the North. I thank you all for being here. And today, I'm going to give myself a little license because Ken has given you a superb talk in giving feedback. <laughs> I've got a feedback form for you. You will torture me if you don't give me feedback today. <laughs> And it just got three sections. What I did well, one suggestion for improvement in any comments. Please, please try to say something to help me be better. I've got the forms filled up here at home. And I, I just, I, I study public speaking. I believe I have a great responsibility and a privilege to communicate well. I can't tell you how useful feedback is. I get feedback that I can't imagine that I'm doing these things. So please, anything that you see, you can't hurt my feelings, or at least not for long. <laughs> so please, promise yourself, and Ken, if they don't give me feedback, I'll have to pull you up. <laughs> yeah, you blame me. It's OK. <laughs> All right, so also, I want to thank Brittany. Every now and then, she records one of my videos. I have got this little kink in my head that knowledge should be shared. And many of my presentations, she has recorded them. Uh, Brittany, thank you for being here and coming at such short notice. And she's an extraordinary person to work with. If any of you all have video recording needs, I highly recommend her. Now we get to work. Yours truly. How clever we are after the deed is done. So why, why not me? Why can't I be a Monday morning quarterback too? But it comes down to one question. OK, Rashid, you're so smart. What would you do differently? This became the question. It just became a theoretical question. Suppose one of you could whoop, magic wand. You go back to the past. You're in charge of all risk management in Enron. You're in charge of risk management in the financial industry. What would you do? What would you do? Suddenly, I start getting nervous. <laughs> Talking is easy. But this was, it became a question for me. Now, when I was young, I had the good fortune of having a twin brother. And one of our, I still have, I mean. <laughs> But, and we still talk every day, but when we were young, Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie, we would devour them. We fantasized about being really good detectives. So a little thrill for me. I still try. I enjoy figuring out things. And uh, that's what I decided I'll be. But I wasn't going to make this a research project. I was just going to be on the lookout for the word risk and try to eventually build a case over time. Would I really understand it without making it a case study? First thing I want to deal with is leadership. It's so easy to criticize leadership. And no doubt they were fallible. And no doubt that there may have been flaws in their character. But I have reached this conclusion that were they so smart or so stupid that they just willfully let this happen? And I don't believe that I can credit more than 50% of the fault to to willful fraudulence, you know, to poor character. There's something more going on that we need to look into. And I believe that more than 50% of it comes down to negligence, ignorance, and delusion. And I'm not using this in a derogatory word. All of us are negligent of something. All of us are ignorant of many things. And all of us believe things that aren't true. But at a higher level, 
the more you do this, the greater the risk. And this is for your projects too. You don't know everything that's going on on your projects. You just don't. You are ignorant of some things and you have some assumptions which will prove to be untrue. I'll give you another example. In India, there was this company, Satyam. So sort of similar to Enron, you know, clever guys, tremendous profits, hiding, fudging the books. But he, after he got caught and went to jail, he said something that is worth paying attention to. He basically said, I felt like I was riding a tiger, and once I got on, there was no way for me to get off without being eaten by it. And as a risk manager or project manager, and your project is going wrong, we can very well find ourselves in this situation if we don't know how to get off. I'm going to use one more word, risk illiteracy. I actually got it from a book. But I believe that far more than we think we are risk illiterate, especially from a psychology inner programming point of view, not so much in quantitative and qualitative analysis. And this case is made over and over again. We have this ability to be confident in our presumption, in our risk analysis, but there's a lot we don't know. So the quest, one question comes up, what the risk analyst, analytical tools up to the job, especially, okay, leave Enron, especially for the financial crisis, because they were dealing with like hundreds of thousands of transactions every day, many of them built on uh, documents that are this thick. Were they really able to analyze it? Common question. So what they said in their prospectuses, that's something called VAR, value at risk. And they were very good at convincing the investors, perhaps themselves, that we are on top of everything. We've got these superb models. We've got these wonderful PhDs from this university and that university. We know what we are doing. So a VAR would appear on all the statements frequently. And it gave them a confidence that they knew the risks. Blind to complexity or even just the amount of transactions going on. Lehman Brothers, in their report, they said, on a really bad day, we might lose 42 million. And yet, on the day that they had to shut down, they lost billions. The risk analysis tools were not up to the task. So as a risk manager, you, you can only you have the tools that you have. But be aware that frequently, they are just not up to the task. What do you do in this situation? So that was my project to myself. Be, you know, look out for this word risk when you're reading or when you're trying to learn. And what follows is a little bit of a report from that little adventure of mine. But first, I want to plant a seed. I want you to hold two thoughts and two critical skills in your mind right till the end of the presentation. The first one comes from Richard Feynman. It comes from the world of academia. He's a Nobel Prize winner, a great physicist, author, very famous man. And he told his students in one of his lectures, there's a famous series of Feynman lectures, the first rule is you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. We are doing work. We want the results. We tend to skew, oh, we, we, we tend to misread it. And he said, this is a fundamental flaw in science. You have to figure out what is happening. Don't fool yourself. The first rule is that you don't fool yourself. And this is almost something you should, before you take on the role of a risk manager or you hire one, am I willing not to fool myself? Because I am the easiest person to fool when I want something to be a certain way. So hold this thought in mind. It happens to all of us. This is biology. This is our inner programming. Second comes from a sort of half politician, successful author from quite a while ago. He was kind of involved in politics and it is extremely difficult to make a man understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. <laughs> it is extremely difficult to make a person understand something when their values or their status or something along those lines depends on them not understanding it. And frequently, if you're a risk manager and you have to report to your boss, you will face this. What will you do then? In fact, have any of you all faced this? At the receiving end or the giving end? Sure. And that's just being human. You know, we are not rational machines. 
We have all these systems inside of us that make us not hear what we don't want to hear. Critical skill to overcome this objectivity. And I mean be neurotically rational. Keep saying to yourself, Rashid, this is the time to be neurotically rational. There are some times when I've got to be intuitive, sometimes I've got to judge. But when doing this work, be neurotically rational. And I believe this is one of the most underrated qualities, equanimity, complete balance, calmness. You don't get excited. You look at everything from all points of view. It's one of the highest skills to develop even in your relationships with others. Equanimity comes down to this. Be unattached to whatever the outcome is. Whichever way the data takes me, whatever conclusions I have to reach, I'm not going to be attached to it. It's a great skill to develop. And the second one, I'll just touch on it now because none of you will think it's essential to risk management. I'll make my case later on. Be willing to campaign. Be willing to persuade. I want you to vote for risk management. Look at it like an unending task. Not me give you my report and walk away. If you want the company to be safe, are you willing to take on the work of a campaign? If we could, on our agenda, we have two items, prospect theory and the power of noticing. Let's start with prospect theory. Anyone familiar with this term at all? When you are confronting a loss, you will take more risks. When things are going well, you will be less risk averse. Almost like you're two different people. This theory, please take it really seriously. It was put out by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Amos Tversky is widely regarded as probably one of the smartest people who ever lived. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough. Daniel Kahneman, OK, so people put out papers. This is probably the most successful academic paper of all times, or it's right on top out there. It came out in the 70s. Daniel Kahneman went on to win the Nobel Prize. Both of them would have got it for this paper. And it's unique. He got it in economics being a psychologist. This paper resulted in a whole new field called behavioral economics. Very influential, so be aware of it. I'm going to show you this slide again and again. I really want it to go into your heads. When you confront losses, you are more likely to take risks. Your schedule is falling behind, you'll do something that's risky. Your budget's falling behind, you'll do something that's risky. Quality is falling behind, oh my god, uh, we have to give it to the customer, forget about quality management, you'll take risks. Two more words to remember, two more phrases. One is prospect theory, second, domain of losses, domain of gains. I'm either in a situation where I'm making losses or gains. And I will decide differently depending on which domain I'm in. So please put this language into your head. Prospect theory, domain of losses, domain of gains. I'm going to just give you a little experiment to show how this works. Let's say I give you $300. Call me Santa Claus, say thank you Santa Claus. But you're in a domain of gains now. All right? This experiment has been done repeatedly for many decades, some version of this. Now I'm going to give you a choice, A or B. If you select A, I give you $100, you go home clear, no risk, $400. If, I, if you select B, you agree, I'm going to toss a coin. If you win the toss, you're going to get another $200, you'll go home with $500. But if you lose the toss, I give you nothing, you go home with $300. Option A, you go home with $400. Option B, you'll go home with either $300 or $500. If I present the problem to you this way, most people select option A. Same experiment. You already have $500. And then I'm going to give you an option, A or B. And what you'll see is the setup is it's exactly the same odds, but you'll take an opposite decision. I'm going to take $100 away from you. Nothing you can do about it. You go into a domain of losses. And I'm going to toss a coin. If you win the toss, you keep your $500. But if you lose the toss, I'm going to take away $200. If I present the same odds to you in this way, most people choose option B. Exactly the same statistical law. This is a kind of mathematical way of showing you what prospect theory is at a very, very basic level. When facing losses, we take more risks. I want to toss, I want my $500, no matter what, I'll toss the coin. Oh. So one more time, when confronting losses, decision makers are more likely to take risks. That's all of you all as project managers. So that sounds like a theory, a little bit of a puzzle. <laughs> Okay, I kept it in the back of my mind, but then I came across this book, really a remarkable book, if a little difficult to read, very academic, but 
I strongly recommend you give it a shot. Four case studies. And we're going to look at only one today. It's called the U2 crisis. How many are familiar with the U2 crisis? About 20%. Okay. So Dwight Eisenhower. Unique in America. He's one of the most respected, admired, liked presidents. There was this campaign slogan, I like Ike. But it was really true. <laughs> Unique in American politics, both parties approached him and said, we, you want, we want you to be our candidate for president. He was that one. Everyone knew that he would win. So we wanted him. And yet, something went terribly wrong when this man, supreme commander of the Allied, for, Allied forces, and you can't imagine the pressure and the responsibility he has taken. But he was unaware of prospect theory, and just we're going to see how he fell into the trap. I want to read this out so that I maintain accuracy from the book. Then came the U-2 crisis. The, United, the USSR, they were called the Soviets at that time, they shot down a U-2 spy plane over their territory. The U-2 crisis was the first time an American president was caught openly engaging in deception. Strange as it may seem today, the public exposure of governmental cover-up genuinely shocked the American public in 1960. Don't laugh like that. <laughs> Prior to shooting down the plane, Eisenhower was in a good position. He was in a domain of gains. In fact, they were working with Khrushchev for a peace conference. From the time of the U-2 program, when it started in 1956, four years ago, he was risk averse. He was in a domain of gains. He understood risks, but he felt it was justified to send these planes over the Soviet Union. He had the option of rejecting all the spy planes, missions. But here is one of history's great ironies. He's a military man. I mean, he's loyal to the military. But yet, he began to realize that these guys will just make up any amount of threats for more money, more money, money. So he began, he said, I cannot succumb to constant military pressure. So he was sending the YouTube, YouTube flights to satisfy himself that the Soviets weren't as heavily armed as the industry wanted him to believe. There was, there was a widespread perception of a massive Soviet buildup. It was only by using information from these U2 surveillance flights that he was able to resist the domestic opposition and hold a restrained budget. He felt the risks were justified. Why? OK, so let's, let's, let's go over this. This is the headline that came shot down. Soviets shoot down American plane. Here the lies are started. US says it was a Soviet craft. It was a weather craft. And the peace summit was, that was 15 days away, Khrushchev said, I'll have to think about it. The assumptions go like this. The Soviets cannot shoot down this plane because it flies so high. Cannot. It's out of reach. That's why we are sending it. Second assumption, even if they shoot it down, the pilot cannot survive. This is really horrifying. He has to have a, like a poison tablet in his mouth, and if something happens, he has to kill himself. And in case that doesn't happen, there's an eject mechanism in his seat, and they whoop, and he's finished. That was the plan. But guess what? Assumption number one, didn't hold the plane got shot down. Assumption number two, they captured the pilot alive. And actually, Khrushchev, he held on to the information for two, three days, trying to give Eisenhower an out, you know, come up with some excuse so that I can not humiliate you. But no, Eisenhower, here we go. He nonetheless, he kept a close control, and his assumptions didn't hand. So May 1st, 1960, the plane is shot down. A few days later, they announced that they've got the pilot alive. What happens to Eisenhower? He goes into a domain of losses like he has never been in his career before. His criticism of his policies, intense. Worse, there was a planned summit, May, March, May 16th in Paris. At this point, in this domain of losses, this leader, far more experienced than anyone in this room, he appeared to throw caution to the wind. He covered up one lie with another, proceeded to engage a badly planned, poorly orchestrated cover-up. The cover-up was quickly revealed to be the transparent web of lies that it was, and Eisenhower was forced to publicly admit to both spying and to lying. That's the sequence of events. Now, in terms of, it could happen to any of us. In terms of prospect theory, Eisenhower became risk-seeking once he was in a domain of losses. Does that make sense? Let's recap. Eisenhower is an extremely popular president. When the U-2 plane was shot down, a lot of authority, a lot of freedom, 
lot of immense quality of judgment. There appears to be no good reason why he would have risked his reputation, the reputation of his country, his aspirations for world peace, by such injudicious behavior, lying, getting caught, and having to admit it. But now, time to remind ourselves on prospect theory. What does prospect theory say? Everybody believed that Eisenhower was a phenomenal leader who would not take uncharacteristic, foolish risks. But that's only half the story. Prospect theory tells us that any one of us, when confronting these losses, will take risks. You and I will take these risks, especially if we are not aware of the language. Prospect theory, domain of gains, domain of losses, risk seeking. So add this language to your risk management, even if you're just sitting down. Team, there is something called prospect theory. Just read up the basics on it. We will take risks when things are not going well. Use this word, are we in a domain of losses or a domain of gains? Our behavior will, be, will, be, will change depending on where we are. So use this language. Now I'm sure in light of this, all of you have thought of, it's happened to you. I'll tell you one personal story that happened to me. I got lucky. So I had, many years ago, I used to fix engines and stuff. So I had a team of maybe six, eight, ten guys. And for two, three days, we had to open up this engine and close it. So let's say we had four days. And for two and a half days, the boys did everything. The team did everything extremely well, fully opened up the engine, put it back together, but unfortunately assembled one part wrong. Now, let's say the value of this contract was $30,000. If I delayed the ship and the ship has to pay $50,000 per day, and all those costs were coming on me. I was in a huge domain of losses. And you've had this in your projects. And the way I pushed the guys, we had to open it up. What we did in two and a half days finished in less than one day. And I don't remember the exact days, but I remember. And I got lucky. Fortunately, things worked. But I could have. I mean, just imagine if we did that wrong, the ship pulled out and there was an accident in the port. Or, ooh. Same thing that happened to Eisenhower could happen to any of us, especially if we are not aware that we become risk-seeking. So the question becomes, do you think that anyone at Enron was aware that things are really not going well, therefore we have to step up the risks, step up the risks, step up the risks. Don't discuss it. I, I believe they had to have, I mean, you're a smart guy, you can see something that's happening, but you can justify it to yourself. I think it happened in both places. One more time, when confronting losses, you or your risk managers will take more risks, especially if you're not aware of prospect theory and how it drives our behavior. So now we go on to our second topic, the power of noticing. Just, just noticing, nothing more. It comes from a book called The Power of Noticing, what the best leaders note. And I'm, this man is very highly well known for being an expert on decision making. Uh, so that is why I bought the book. You know, very, very highly respected, right at the top of the field, professor at Harvard, the whole nine yards. And we'll talk about only three, three observations from the book. There's something called inattentional blindness, motivated blindness, and slippery slope. Let's start with inattentional blindness. Actually, it's pretty self-explanatory. But what he said, he watched a video once, and it really shocked him. You all are probably familiar with this video. It's like 10, 12 seconds. There are two teams of two sets of basketball players. One is wearing white shirts, one is wearing dark shirts. It's purposely made grainy. The, both the videos are overloaded. Your task is this. Count the number of passes that the white team is making, that the white shirts are making. Count the number of passes. I'm going to start now. You have to pay attention. Count the number of passes. How many? Ten. Okay, let's go. Hand show for 12, 11, 10, 9. Anyone noticed anything else? Lady walking through. Anyone else noticed? Okay. Yeah, but the key point here is that most of us wouldn't notice the lady walking through. And now this has become famous because there are many things with gorillas and people dressed up as gorillas. So the, now, the, now I'm going to watch the video again. Look for the woman with the umbrella about four or five. 
and see how clearly we missed something that happened right under our noses, or at least I missed it. Here we go. There we go. Large as life. Over the last over the last month, I've done this three times. This is the third time. And every time, I can either count the passes or I can see. I still can't do both, even though I know what's happening. So this is just a constraint on our ability to pay attention. All right? So how many passes? 11. Inattentional blindness. This is what is called we can't pay attention. Now again, this might sound like some fancy theory put out by academics. Let's talk about what happens in the real world. December 1977, Eastern Airlines Flight 401. Anyone familiar with this accident? One of the most famous accidents. It changed a lot of the aviation industry. Eastern Airlines Flight leaves New York, going to Miami. Almost midnight, 11.33, prepare to land in Miami. The crew notices that the light for the wheels has not come on. Miami says, OK, fix your problem, go around. Captain tells first officer, engage autopilot. And then everybody in the room gets fixated on the bulb, counting the passes. Everyone. Not a single person is seeing what is going on. All they're doing is looking at the bulb. Somehow, the autopilot gets disengaged. Nobody notices. Crew is fully focused on the light. Count the pass, count the pass, count the pass. Don't miss it. Oh my God, is it the filament? Is it the light? Plane begins descending. Nobody notices. Seven minutes later, something is really wrong with the altitude. Emergency measure is taken. Too late. 101 fatalities, 75 survivors. One light, inattentional blindness. Don't underestimate it. As a project manager or risk manager, don't get too involved in the day-to-day -day tasks. <clears throat> it's called the management by walking around, the power of noticing. Be aware that we can't see everything, and especially sometimes deliberately try to look for things that others aren't seeing. Don't underestimate it. Was there inattentional blindness at Enron? And so maybe the people were so overworked that they couldn't see what was happening. I, I have to believe it was part of it. Motivated blindness. A failure to notice risky behavior when it is not in your interest to notice it. This could be for your boss. If I'm incentivized to view someone positively, my promotion, my pay depends on it, it is more difficult for me to even assess risky behavior. And then he gives case after case after case in the book. Penn State football, very successful football team, bringing in millions of dollars, and the coach was doing horrendous things to the boys. People knew. Everybody kept their mouth shut. Aggressive traders, the story of Wall Street from Singapore to France. When a company is making tons and tons and tons of money, the pressure to keep quiet and not think about it is very high. And too frequently, we have all the crashes we talk about. Rating agencies, supposed to rate, <laughs> supposed to say what's happening. But see the pressures they come onto. Let's say I'm one of these uh, Wall Street traders in the trading companies. I go to you, you have to rate this, and I, I'm putting this asset together, and I'm telling you, you have to make it a AAA. And if you won't, I'll find someone else who will. <laughs> but that's what happened. Auditing companies, Arthur Anderson, really smart guys in Enron. Why didn't they see what should have been obvious? Because they had a consulting business with Enron that was far more profitable. Motivated blindness. Publishing scholarly papers, I didn't realize this. He's in that world, and the pressure to publish is high. It's called publish or perish. This is how you make your career. And fudging the data, looking the other way is common. This is what Richard Feynman was warning his students again many decades ago. The easiest person to fool is yourself. The first rule is don't fool yourself. And today, this is not from the book. This is in my time. The way we are absorbing political reporting and consuming. We are on one side or the other side. The motivated blindness, I mean, it's screaming at us. Regardless of your political thoughts, or if you're a risk manager, well, red flags are flying everywhere. Motivated blindness, don't underestimate it. Do you think there was motivated blindness at the Enrons and the... Do you think there's motivated blindness on your projects? 
feeling a little tense, it's going to get worse. <laughs> All right, slippery slope. Bernie Madoff. The minute you think, you think that he's a big, big crook. But this person investigated it and he kind of changed my mind a little bit. Bernie Madoff was an investment advisor who turned into a crook. This is how his fraud developed. To begin with, he lost a relatively small amount of money on some trades. He was confident in his ability to make up the losses, so he lied. The actual performance on his report. Had future investments turned out well, now you'll have to take this author at his word, Bernie Madoff may well have returned to a fairly honest life. But subsequent investments did not turn out well. And he escalated the fraud. He had no choice. I've got onto the back of a tiger. I can't get off. When the scale of his fraud drew tremendous media attention, what has not been noticed, and this should be of importance to us as project managers, is it is remarkable how few people noticed what was happening. Madoff went down a slippery slope, and a very large cast of characters, your project team, failed to even notice what was happening. It can be happening on all our projects. And the thing about a slippery slope is, let's say we are moving in that direction, zero degrees, and uh, OK, I'm going to fudge the rules, two degrees. I'm aware of it, but after some time, suddenly that's the new normal, and that's my new heading. And then it's five degrees. And then it's another five degrees, and that's become the new normal. And suddenly I'm going in a completely different direction, and I don't even know it. This is not so much, of course, you have to, can, cannot forgive character, but it's more than that could happen to any one of us. And it has happened to us sometime in our lives. Slippery slope. Oh, you can bet this was happening big time. So we've just covered three sure insights that can help you improve your project manage. Zero doubt that this is happening. Because we are humans, it happens to us. So here's the key takeaway. Our mistakes often begin when we make a minor error, and nobody in this room has not made a minor error. If you have, never put your hand up, I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> but then we cover it up. And at some point, the cover up becomes a bigger error. So include this conversation with your team. Team, we have made mistakes. For sure, we have made mistakes. You have made mistakes. I have made mistakes. Are we covering up? And are we escalating the cover up so that it becomes the more bigger, the, becomes an even bigger mistake? Just include this language in your. Now one more story. And I might not have converted this. I normally I tend to read a lot and I, I like figuring out things. But there is normally a triggering story or an event that makes me say, OK, I'm going to make this a presentation. And in this, there are two. This is one. Malcolm Gladwell is a very famous writer. He's written many books. He's written a lot of articles for The New Yorker. This book is a collection of his New Yorker articles. It's called Open Secrets. Six students from Cornell, 1998, when the Enron stock price, which went to 80 or 90, was still in the 40s. They went and they were told, you know, do the work that graduate students do, review everyone's accounting policies, audit their notes, analyze their business practices, and send us a report. They reach some conclusions. The strategy is far riskier than the competitors. They may be manipulating their earnings. The stock is definitely overpriced. We recommend that you sell this stock. Graduate students were able to see, not because they had more knowledge, not because they were smarter, not because they had more or less character, but they were not constrained by inattentional blindness, motivated blindness, prospect theory. We, if we can focus to be completely objective and unattached to outcomes as risk managers, you will see what everybody else failed to see. So and it's zero, zero doubt that this is what is happening, according to me, in both the Enrons and in the financial crisis. So let's summarize this. All of us prone to inattentional blindness. All of us will face the pressure of motivated blindness. All of us are going down some slippery slope, and we're not being aware of it. Add this language to your conversation. 
for team. This is what is called inattentional blindness. What are we missing on our projects? This is what is called motivated blindness. I know the boss is putting pressure and the stakeholders are putting pressure. Are we covering up? Are we lying? Are we involved in deception? Be aware of a slippery slope. Have we been doing it for a long time and have we strayed so far that we need to correct ourselves? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, like I say, I ask for feedback a lot and most of the feedback I get says that this session, pick a partner and just Say, I'm going to memorize two or three things that I heard today. Discuss for one minute what you heard, and then I will ask you all to shout it out. This combination of processing it, discussing it with someone, and saying it aloud increases the odds that you will remember what I'm talking about. <coughs> Time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen seconds to go. Five seconds to go. Time. If you can hear me, clap twice. All right. So now, let's just go around the room. This table, one takeaway. Inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness. I think the prospect theory side of things is a different discussion. We do go, we do take those risks, and we just. Um, Something that we do. Be aware of domain of losses. Perfect. One takeaway. If you're not invested in it, you can see it more clearly. Okay. Even if you're invested in it, be neurotically rational, be objective. We are invested in our projects. Right, exactly. Being, oh, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah, but it has to be done. It's the job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to protect your company and your project. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, I dare say, sometimes what makes our job worthwhile. And I'll come down to the campaigning. I'll come down to the campaigning bit, which I introduced you to. I'll show you how to do it. Last table. What pearls of wisdom did you gather, sir? I think it should go with that one, the just be unattached to the outcome. Sorry? Be unattached to the outcome. Be detached. Excellent. Motivational blindness is real. It's real. It's absolutely real. Being invested in doubling down on it when you're on the slippery, slippery slope. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, normally I do a longer version of this. Yesterday I took it out and I didn't feel good. So I'm just saying there's this real book. It's completely different from every, I spoke about prospect theory, completely different from quantitative and qualitative analysis. I spoke about observation. Here he talks about I'll just mention it quickly. I recommend you pick up this book. He talks about use intuition and heuristics. So what is intuition? Uh, I'll give you two examples. I remember when I was reading the book called Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Steve Jobs made a trip to India. And then he said when he came back, he had like a reverse culture shock because he was so used to people thinking intuitively that he found no one was doing it in the US. And perhaps his special skill was to intuitively search inside himself for what will work, what won't work. So I, when I grew up, intuitions, emotions were to be totally discarded. No part of it. You be neurotically rational, that's the only game in town. That's important, but that's not the only game in town. And then all arguments were knocked out when I came across this quote. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society where they have the servant and we have forgotten the gift. So just be tuned in that we have something called intuition. He makes the case very well in the book. Use it as a risk management tool. He gives a real example. Suppose I can't decide, do I want a window? Do I want a Windows computer? Do I want a Mac? Do I, 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 I do qualitative analysis and, and I still can't decide? He said, just toss a coin. 
And if something says, I want it to be a Mac, that's what your intuition is telling you. Just draw on your intuition also as part of risk management. Second thing he talks about, heuristics. When things start getting complex, look for something that's simple and go with it. For example, uh, financial crisis, they had something called the collateralized debt obligation. Apparently, hundreds and thousands of pages for hundreds and thousands of instruments, nobody read it, except you know one or two people with Asperger's and the people who wrote it. <laughs> no, I'm, this is not a joke. It's, it's covered in the, the Michael Lewis book. Uh, I can't remember it now. The, the big shot. Same thing with Enron. The uh, special purpose vehicle, special purpose entities. Nobody in the world could read it or understand it. So when you see some extraordinary profits and you don't understand it, I suspect fraud. Now that's an example of a heuristic. Just follow some rule. There's something called, I think it's called Oscam's razor also. Some philosopher, he said, when you have many choices, most likely the simplest one is the correct one. So when someone comes and gives you all kinds of fancy theory, then you see fraud. Just go with your intuition, go with your heurist heuristics, or at least make it a part of your risk management. And I, I can't encourage this. If, if I get a chance to do this longer for 15 minutes more, I can go into much more detail in this. But it's an extraordinary book because it is so different from everything else we learn. Let's summarize where we've been. Memorize this, folks. Memorize this. Don't forget, when confronting losses, decision makers are more likely to take risks. You are a decision maker, and you will confront losses. Add this language, prospect theory, domain of gains, domain of losses. Inattentional blindness, motivated blindness, slippery slope. All right, Monday morning quarterback reporting. I've given you some ideas, but having these ideas, would I really have been able to avert, let's say, an Enron or theoretical Enron or theoretical to the what? Uh, crisis. What really can I do? What else can I do? And a couple of ideas have come up. Let's call them three concepts. Two of them come from a book called Good to Great. How many of you are familiar with this book? Okay, they say in your life, if you want to read only one business book, read this book. It's, it's just part of this book. What he did, he was very fond of data, the author. And uh, he went over, I think, 30 years of Fortune 500 companies. And he selected a group of companies that stood out because for 15 years they performed better than the stock market by a factor of five or six. And not only that, these companies had companies like sister companies in the same field that didn't perform well. So once he isolated them, he came out with a whole set of theories as to why these companies lasted. They were good companies, but they moved to great. What made, it, what made that happen? I'll cover two points out here relevant to what we could do in risk management. These companies were excellent at what he called autopsies without blame. Very much what Ken was saying in a different language. In these companies, there is a sense that there is a climate where the truth can be told. And the exact same applies, it could be for homes, it could be for projects, it could be for relationships. It could be between parents and children. Is there a climate where the truth can be told? Is there a climate on your projects where the truth can be told? Create a culture where the truth can be told. It is the basis of many successful companies. So it could be in their risk management. Second, they had something called an outstanding red flag system, mechanism. So what is a red flag? I have some information. If that information needs to go upstairs, it will go upstairs. It, we can turn information into information that cannot be ignored. If I'm working at a low level, and I see slippery slope, motivated blindness. There is a red flag mechanism in these successful organizations or in these successful projects where the information will go up. Are you a project manager? Are you confident that if something is going wrong on your project that the information will come to you? So I would encourage these two. A climate where the truth can be told and are there good red flag mechanisms? on my project? Am I confident that I will be told when something is going wrong? Finally, this is just a book. It's called Red Teaming. It's the same. It's quite a, quite a, for big projects, have someone playing the devil's advocate. Create a scenario where you run it out. This is mostly used in, for battle scenario setting up. You have the, they have the 
battle plan and you have someone you call the opposing force. But to make it simple on our projects, after I've evaluated everything, who is the outside perspective? In fact, I, I, I don't know. This is I don't know whether it's politics or not. But the world, the way it is, is a book written about the Obama years with by one of his, uh, one of his advisors. I've forgotten his name, Ben something, and he said he would always go around the room, everyone, what works, what won't work, what works, what won't work. He was ability to be completely detached from the outcomes. He wanted to make sure that he got as many outside perspectives as he could. Then he would sleep over it at night. That is, say that things would work in my brain, intuition, whatever. But if he had successful decision making in your point of view and in the point of view of that author, this may have had something to do with it. Am I getting an outside perspective from what I believe? Build it into your risk management. So let's close now. Let's go back to where we were. Two closing thoughts, two critical skills. Richard Feynman, anyone remembers? What did he say? Don't fool yourself. And? We're the easiest person to do. Not just don't fool yourself. The first rule is that you don't fool yourself. <laughs> and you are the easiest person to fool. All of us, all of us. What did Upton Sinclair say? There's money on the line. Hmm? So we just it is very difficult to convince a man of something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And I can tell you both these quotes. My, I have a twin brother. He's a doctor. He's written a book about pitfalls in the intensive care where he works. And I got both these quotes from his book. It happens everywhere. He's put these as headings to his chapters. <laughs> Don't fool yourself as a doctor, especially in intensive care. And sometimes there's so much pressure to make profits that you will, I mean, the patient becomes not the top priority. And I can tell you, given the bad outcomes or the less satisfactory outcomes, it's probably more prevalent here than in most other advanced countries. Critical skill, be objective, hard as it is, be objective. And it's a skill that can be developed. And I'd, I'd like to answer your question. Everyone's got their own coping mechanism. But for example, when I come to speak, or when you come to speak, sometimes we say we get nervous. But it always comes down to sensations in your body. If you start tuning into your body sensations and just being, OK, I'm having a little nervous here, anxiety out here. This ability to watch your body sensations almost as if you're someone else watching it is a key skill to remaining objective. And again, people who worked with Obama said he had this skill extraordinarily. And many people you work with, they don't feel they're criticizing. They want to hear it. Kennedy, after the Bay of Pigs, he promised himself, I will never, he, the Bay of Pigs was a disaster. He believed what is, someone else was doing it in the past. He believed it. From then onwards, you will give me an outside perspective. He insisted on it. Objectivity. Be, laugh at yourself. Be neurotically rational. This is a time for neurotically rational. There's a time to be intuitive. There's a time to have discussion. But sometime, I will shut down everything, and I will be neurotically rational. Equanimity, balanced. Are we a balanced team? Are we thinking in a balanced way or are we just fighting for one side? It's a good skill to have, not the only one. Be non-attached to outcomes. That really is what this talk is entirely about. And now I come down to the last one. Be willing to campaign. Ma'am, here's the answer to your question. It comes from a book as usual. It's called To Move the World, JFK's Quest for Peace. One of the best books I've read. October 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis. Please tell me that you all have heard of it. <laughs> it is the single greatest uh, crisis management case study. And Kennedy re recorded everything secretly. He stopped trusting a lot of people, and he recorded it. So we have a kind of data that is almost unavailable for other crisis management cases. Hundreds of books, hundreds of movies are written about it. For 13 days, the world was on edge. 200 planes armed with nuclear weapons flying over Soviet area around Cuba. There was a quarantine, Soviet armed mis submarines with nuclear weapons almost launched. It was amazing. They agree that, OK, here they are. Two combatants, Kennedy and Khrushchev, are caught up in a situation that has escalated, 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 escalated. And Kennedy also said, I just give us a 33% chance, one third that we will survive. One third that we will make a strategic mistake, and one third that we will make a communication mistake. Somehow, this 
accepted. The first line or second line in that book is the world survived by dumb luck that day. But these two men had gone to a place where no one has ever gone. And in many ways, this is the risk management part of government. You've got to have infrastructure and taxes and all. But a big part of government is risk management. In fact, Michael Lewis has written a book called The Fifth Risk. It's all about government and takes over. But fifth risk of government is the failure of project management in government. The failure to see what is happening on a really large scale. So here we are. These two guys have gone to a terrible place. In fact, Khrushchev used to say that if another nuclear war comes, those who survive will envy those who didn't. And Kennedy would repeat it. This is, what, this is where we took the world. So they said, enough, enough, enough. We will find a way to peace. And both of them were squeezed between their hardliners on both sides. And as a project manager, you probably feel the same too. You have to balance many forces. But they said, enough. And in less than a year, they signed a partial nuclear test ban treaty. It is a feat that has not been repeated since then. So why did they succeed? This is what he writes in the book. Now I'm going to ask you to read what I've highlighted. Can you read it? Can everyone read it? No? Okay, here we go. The partial test ban treaty was signed and ratified for one overwhelming reason. Because Kennedy campaigned for it. He was a gifted campaigner. In six campaigns, he never lost. And he triumphed again in the summer of 63. And this might seem like just something to read, but when I read this, electrical storms went off in my head. If Kennedy had not committed to being a good speaker, when he was a young man, he was covering the war in the, war in the United Kingdom, he admired Churchill greatly. He would sit down and put on Churchill records and practice and practice. He knew that oratory was very powerful. He relished it. He championed it. He aspired to greatness in it from the time he was young. And that skill, he was able to cajole, charm, twist everybody's arms. But we have to get to peace. He stopped saying that I'm the president, I'm giving you orders, you will do it. Because he knew that would fail. Wilson Woodrow, he studied that. Wilson Woodrow failed in the League of Nations. He basically gave orders saying I'll do this. Kennedy knew that this won't work. He campaigned for it. He would get, he's a Democrat, he would get a senator from the Republican side to make the announcement for here and there. I mean, he played a masterful game. But he treated it like a campaign. And that is what... None of you all will think that this is an essential skill. If you're hiring a risk manager and he's the smartest guy but he can't convince anyone, you're not taking a good hire. Are you willing to be a powerful, persuasive speaker? I am campaigning. It's an unending campaign. Risk management is an unending campaign. I have to speak up on behalf of risk routinely. I have to use all the skills of a skillful communicator, of a campaigning manager. I have to convince you. I have to make rational arguments, but that's just one part of it. At some point, you will not be able to understand what I'm saying, especially if your salary depends on it, or your status, or your job depends on it. At that point, you have another weapon. It's called charm. It's a skill that you can learn. I'm not talking about artful manipulation. I'm not talking about artful flattery. Charm is a way we get to like each other. We get to work with one another. It doesn't matter if things are going wrong. I like Jim. I will work with him. I know he will yell at me for something I've done today. But if you understand that charm is a powerful campaigning skill, you can use it. So, and then finally, the, that's just the second part of it. The third is you have to be willing to cajole. Jim, what are you doing on this project? Do you want us to end up like Enron? The ability to approach, the, almost like we have three parts in our brain, the threatened part, the reptile part, you've got to communicate to it. We have the emotional part. We have to be able to communicate. I want to work with this person. We want to succeed. We have the rational part. This skill is, I say, a top skill that any risk manager should develop. And I'm telling you because I somehow got fascinated by public speaking and wrote a book on it. I can't tell you how much that this is a secret hiding in plain sight. The ability, someone will come and talk about change management and risk management for one month and no one will listen to him. And a great speaker will come in half an hour, half an hour and everybody's on board. I mean, surely this is worth studying. It should be part, if you have a risk manager, he must be willing to campaign. You are a risk manager. 
Are you willing to step up and campaign on behalf of risk management, knowing it will get extremely uncomfortable, not slightly uncomfortable? But the ability, if you can't convince your boss, you can say, it's on me. I have to find another method. I have to. My top job is not to serve the boss. It is to serve the project. Our survival is key before we talk about other things. And if we fail in risk management, we fail in that. So I'll leave you with this. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to campaign. Thank you.